Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is John May. I'm the manager of the platform security team at Netflix. Um, those of you who are Netflix subscribers have probably noticed that over the last few years, we're starting to make more and more of our own movies and TV shows. And so we've gotten into the, um, the movie business, the movie production business, the animation business in a really big way. And as we've done that, we've learned quite a bit about how that goes in a business that has existed for over 100 years. Um, we also are learning a lot more about how we do security in that world, which is, as it turns out, very different from doing security in, in the streaming world that we, that we already knew something about. And so we have with us tonight um, three people who are working, uh, working hard in the field here. Uh, uh, we have um, Stephanie Cheng, who's the uh, product manager in the animation studio. We have Ben Lim, who's the manager of the studio information security team in Los Angeles. And we have Patrick Thomas, who's uh, getting our slides just right. And he is a senior uh, security partner in our application security team in Los Gatos with a focus on the studio business. Uh, we're going to try to get through this, um, you know, certainly before 8 o'clock. And in order to move right along, we'd like to hold the questions until the end. And then also tomorrow night, uh, there are going to be several of us, you'll see our pictures at the end, who are going to be at the Netflix reception. And we'd be happy to have you uh, come and chat with us about studio or any kind of uh, security that you're interested in. So we'll get started now with Stephanie. Yay. Hello. Can you hear me? Is this working? Yeah? OK. You guys are really spread out. <laughs> OK, so I'm Stephanie. Uh, I'm the product manager for the animation studio. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context on some of the challenges of starting a new studio um, and what that means for their world. And uh, it's a very, very nascent business, right? You might think of Netflix, and you think of the streaming side, and you're like, that's a mature business. Most of the challenging problems are solved. So I'm going to tell you that's not true. We have so many issues and so many problems uh, through the lens of building this new animation studio. So um, how many of you out there are animation fans and you watch animated content? OK, amazing. Uh, so within our service, animation performs really well. Uh, it's often in the top 10 list. Um, a lot of our members come back and load into it, animated content um, every month. And so it's a really important uh, content vertical for us. And as you guys know, Disney Plus started their own thing. And they're going to be pulling their catalog from us. So it was really important for us to set up our own stream of animated content. Um, so just a quick background, we House of Cards in 2012, that was our first like commissioned property. Um, our first wholly owned original property was The Ranch in 2016. And so now we're at, it's going to be this year. Of our first original animated content. So it's very exciting. So I started about two years ago, and we were going to build an animation studio to have our own animated content control our own destiny. And so some of the really exciting things about this is we were going to have feature and series sit together. And that's not really done before, um, but we were like, we can leverage um, how series works and how feature works, and they can cross uh, functionally sort of collaborate, and we could get better material, better content, better creative energy between both. Um, another really special thing about what we're doing, so Disney's greatest strength is also kind of their biggest weakness. They have a really, really strong house brand. And that's a wonderful thing because you could recognize a Disney property anywhere. But if you have a creator there who wants to do something a little edgier, something more adult, something in a sketchy style, they can't. And so at Netflix, we want to give them the opportunity to tell the best story they want to tell in any style um, they want to tell it in. So it's really exciting. And then we're going to house a ton of projects uh, in production at any given time. So those were sort of the goals of the studio um, when I started. Some of, those some of the challenges. Um, animation production is really, really hard. I'm going to go into this a little bit more. Um, we also have a really ambitious slate. The number of active productions just like far eclipses what other studios are doing. Um, we want creators to have that freedom, so we're going to be able to support any style, genre, and format. From a pipeline perspective, that's really challenging, right? Disney is set up to do one type of movie really well. They're a beast. If we want to do all these films, all these styles, and do them all really well, it's really hard to pivot. Um, plus the technical scale. Uh, entertainment is not an industry that openly welcomes technology. Um, I used to work in politics, and it's kind of the same thing. 
uh, information is currency, closest to talent is everything, right? Those aren't things that lend itself really well to building great technology. And finally, you have the challenges of building a new venture. We're building a studio from the ground up, all the challenges of providing uh, infrastructure, of providing space, um, rolling out hardware and software, like those all exist too. So it's been a really tough two years, but really fun too. So <laughs> and the, I think the thing that most people, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about animation production so you have some context for how hard this process is. Um, the thing that most people don't realize is animation is much, much more labor intensive than live action. So if you think of like a Marvel movie, those are crazy expensive because they're like 90% VFX. Animation is 100% VFX. Um, it takes a crew of anywhere from 250 to 350 people, anywhere from two and a half to four or five years to complete a feature length film. Um, and if you take, say, a blade of grass, that blade of grass has been imagined by a visual development artist, uh, modeled by a modeler, textured by a surfacing artist, animated by an effects artist, lit by a lighter, composited by a compositor, and so on. That's just a blade of grass. So multiply that by everything in the world. Um, and it's really, really labor intensive. There's, uh, there's a lot of steps. Um, I think the wonderful thing about animation, this is just my plug for animation, the flip side is that you have a truly collaborative, artistic product. And I think it's one of the few times, in live action, it's usually one director driving a vision. In animation, you really get a sense that all these people have plus one on that, and they've created this world for you to live in. And I think the result is that many animated properties are so enduring in a way that live action is not as much. So there's some beautiful artwork from different animated properties. So um, some of the other challenges that I mentioned um, we really navigate a legacy culture, right? If you look at the studio side versus the technology side, um, our roots in technology were very much end of pipeline. We take content and we put them on our service. So it was about ingestion. Technology is very egalitarian. It's very one culture. Even though we're a global company, we subscribe to the same culture. Um, and we rely a lot on structured data and metrics. The studio side, completely different. Full pipeline, and it's all about creation. It's very hierarchical. It's very um, legacy, mixed culture. Everyone has their own workflows. Everyone has their own idea of what it is to, to do the best. Um, and also, they rely a lot on unstructured data and instinct and tribal knowledge. And it's really, a lot of people conflate um, the expertise of their role with the mechanics of their role. And so it's really hard to separate that, and it's really hard to build for them. On top of that, most processes are offline, right? So a, per, a creator and a show, they can create their whole show on pen and paper. So here you see um, a schedule, you see script breakdowns. Um, they don't need you. They don't really need to work with you. They're on deadlines, they have budgets. And so if you don't build them something that works, they will move on. So that's also a huge challenge, is that there's a, even a language gap in what you talk about and what a workflow is and what a pain point is. Like oftentimes you have to explain context uh, even for that. So all of this um, on top of a very ambitious slate, we're on track to produce more animation than ever and become basically one of the major content producers for animated uh, content. And so to do that, we are sort of splitting up what we call the front and the back end. So the front end is like the story process, um, getting to a point where we feel really comfortable with the story, the visual design, um, the cut of the film. And then the back end is where production actually happens, right? It's that pipeline where you create all your assets and CG. So we're splitting that up. We're doing the front end in-house. We're doing the back end with vendors all across the world. And that sort of gives us the flexibility to support a diversity of style and formats. So this is really amazing. Um, no other company really has ever attempted this level of quality and this level of innovation in a non-vertically integrated studio. And by vertically integrated, I mean Disney, where all these front end and back end, they all sit together. So it's really ambitious. Um, and so this is a key problem. To reach our global workforce capacity, we really have to be able to ex we have to be able to expand our reach to hit those people. Like in Ukraine, uh, in South Africa, like there's only 1,500 really really good storyboard artists in the world, and so to reach them and to be able to have them work on our productions, we need to be able to um, spin them up super quickly. So 
you might think getting all these people together, having all these content collaborators sounds like nothing compared to the 165 million members that we have in streaming, but it's a really different problem to solve. Um, activities that need to be done within our ecosystem are super varied, right? They need to be able to read, they need to be able to write, merge, process. Um, it's different than just watching content. Secondly, data sets for content creation are just way bigger than watching content. And third, collaboration is a different model. Instead of a one-to-many, it's many-to-many. -many. They might be passing off assets and collaborating all over the place at the same time. So our challenge becomes, how do we give a new artist the right context? If I have that artist in Ukraine, how can I get them set up and ready to go so they're loaded up with the right um, assignment, the right production, the right collaborators, the right assets, the right references, everything. And, and it just spins up and they're ready to go, right? That could usually take production staff, emails, drive folders. That could in itself be hours long um, organizing the things for all these artists. But we want to be able to spin this up really, really quickly. Um, and we kind of want to be able to apply like the four people in a garage mentality at scale uh, so that we can spin up all these artists all over the world, have them load into the right production. They're collaborating on assets. They're showing cuts and dailies to a director. Um, they're going through reviews. Um, and that all this information flowing across both our teams, our vendor teams, is secure. We know who's who. They have the right identity. They have the right permissions and we don't live in this like super fragmented, uneven ecosystem. So, and this is what we're up against, because <laughs> if we don't get that right, they'll go right back to this, which on a per show basis, like maybe it's okay, they'll finish their show. When we're talking about all the shows that we wanna make, this becomes completely unsustainable, right? So I think about this all the time. <laughs> So these are some of the artists I support. Um, James Baxter, he was the animator on Belle and Beauty and the Beast. Jorge Gutierrez, um, really famous Mexican animation director. They spend, on average, about 25% of their time not on the creative complexities of their job, but on stuff like email management, um, file naming. And I want to take that and like reduce it <laughs> and so that they can have the energy to tell the best story that they can um, and have the energy to make these very complex creative decisions. So um, things have to just work at the end of the day. If they don't trust us, they won't use it. Um, and if they don't have a good experience, they won't use it. So that's sort of um, the studio world that we're up against. So this is just a deep dive in animation, which is my world, but we also have a whole nother live action space with another million people working on productions across the world. So you can, as you can imagine, the complexities just build up. So I'm gonna pass it off to Ben, who's then gonna relate this to his work. Thank you. Um, apologies for the little janky handoff there. Um, my name is Ben Lim. They call me, some people call me Blim. I lead the studio infosec team uh, at Netflix. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview on our team. We're the newest infosec team at Netflix, and we're using what we call an embedded security model. Um, I've been here for around 19 months. Um, general neophyte in the grand scheme of being part of any company. Uh, but that actually puts me at over 55% tenure. So, like in the grand scheme of things, I'm pretty old at Netflix, and the majority of those hires, um, well, thank you very much. Okay, Boomer. Um, <laughs> it's been a sharp rise of employees. It's been a bunch of Stephanies. It's been a bunch of people on our studio side in the business functions and the engineering teams that support our, our content creation needs. And the majority of those hires, uh, you know, are down in LA and globally. Um, and, you know, as many of you know, Netflix has primarily historically been based here in Los Gatos, but our headcount numbers are actually larger in LA and globally uh, comparably. So as I kind of look out, I see Asta over there. Hi, Asta, uh, our Director of Application Security. I see Swathi over there, our, our, uh, who leads our IR team at Netflix. 
we were thinking like, okay, we have all these people down in LA. We have this like rapidly growing business that we really don't understand. And we have a lot of great context about how we've, you know, done things historically around the streaming product. Well, how the heck are we going to bridge those gaps without duplicating security teams unnecessarily? And what we selected on was what we call an embedded security model. Some of you may have heard the term BISO or Business Information Security Officer. Uh, we think this is probably the most effective way for us to embed, gain an understanding in, in discovery of this like rapidly different type of business model uh, than it is to actually operate and run a consumer facing product. And so for those that came looking for embedded security talks around like how to you know, protect your Lime or Bird scooters, this is not it. All right, so let's consider Giovanni Ribisi uh, and Saving Private Ryan. I, maybe some of you have seen it, maybe not. Um, but he was the medic for the Rangers who were on their mission to save Private Ryan. Um, he wasn't there to not just treat the Rangers in the field, but he was there to proactively ensure their health and safety. So how did he do that? Well, he had a first class understanding of how the Rangers operate. He's not just some like outside doctor. He was there in there with them, understood how they operated in a first class way. Uh, Irwin Wade then also had to develop trust with those Rangers, you know, to really sort of understand like how they operate and to make sure like he's there in there in the fight with them. And then they had to have clear communications. This is not some medic sitting in the back. They're, they're out there in the field. And they really need to have that strong line of direct communications between the Rangers and the medic. And finally, do you think this medic is going to actually stop all those rangers from like saving Private Ryan? Clearly not, like he is not a blocker, he is an enabler. And so much like Irwin Wade, our studio information security team is composed of a set of security partners that we directly deploy into each of our studio businesses out in the field. Um, so as Stephanie indicated, we have um, a pretty large ambitious studio and production slate. So if you look at all the way down in the bottom right hand corner, there's the air traffic control tower. You can consider that a studio function. You got to bring all these production planes in for a landing. And as Stephanie mentioned, it's pretty ambitious. Animation is just one slice. We have many other different types, kids and family, unscripted, international original, series fe uh, features, and they're all kind of made slightly differently. And many other studios are actually vertically sliced up like this. But in order for us as Netflix to have a globally connected studio, we're really making a big strategic bet on not having those, those vertical slices. I should have done the other way, horizontally in that case, um, if you want to be specific. But what we've done is we've taken each of our departments and striped them down across our entire slates. Creatives, people who listen to pitches and to green light the deals, uh, physical production, getting the actual principal photography going, post to finish it up, et cetera, et cetera. And what we've decided for our embedded security team or our SIS team is to deploy them into each one of those because they really do operate quite separately and quite independently. Many of you have heard about our culture and sort of that freedom and responsibility. You add that to dash to the mix and it can kind of become a very dynamic environment. So what the heck does actually a security partner do from the business relationship? The, the pr easiest way to say it is they're there to shape the narrative between the business and information security. When you, we'll be talking with, you know, Patrick will talk later and a lot about how we deal with that from a product engineering perspective, but this is really from an emerging business perspective. And one that you have to consider is not just rapidly growing, but as Stephanie mentioned, at a pretty massive scale. So where do we start? The game of risk. I see Tony. Hi, Tony, from our risk team. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you have risk folks out there, but we have you know, a large landscape to cover. So our security partners are on that front line uh, because they understand how creatives work, because they understand how animation works, or because they understand how the creative marketing uh, elements work. They can really cut through all the, the babble and have a first class understanding of what really matters and what doesn't. Um, there's a lot of new data sets that are being introduced. We've dealt with PII on the subscriber side, but what about like Will Smith's talent PII? How should we handle that? Uh, what about the data sets for like shooting locations for sensitive titles or confidential marketing campaigns or insights that our creatives use to actually green light and make deals from analytics provided by our data science team? Another area that we're looking at is uh, the risks around pre-release content security. Um, some of you may hear like Marvel is pretty, they run a really tight ship, you know, for instance, around their content. Uh, Endgame's a pretty big, you know, sort of production. And that kind of makes sense. There's a pretty strong correlation or belief in the entertainment industry 
that uh, early leaks may impact revenue impact, have revenue impact when you think about a theatrical release. Well, what if The Irishman leaked early? What if Stranger Things or The Witcher? Would that really have as a direct correlation to our subscriber growth and retention? These are the kind of things that we need to start working through and start taking a look at a really ambitious slate to figure out how do we actually separate the, the noise, uh, the signal from the noise. And so what one example of that is our, our team is working on is a data-driven method to help us take a look at our entire slate or programming grid to figure out clearly Stranger Things 4 or Stranger Things 4 is probably going to resonate and be a little uh, you know, more of a possible target than Alexa and Katie season seven, which is some kids and family show. They're both equally important, but they obviously have different risk profiles. Another area is we don't want our business to be like Abe Simpson, just like you know, shouting into the clouds here. Um, and, and we know that security is not just technical. We need to help these emerging businesses shape their workflows. I was literally just talking with Stephanie a couple minutes ago prior to starting around we need to really improve uh, the, the onboarding workflow, so uh, in the animation side. Uh, identity lifecycle management is a pretty you know, common understanding for many of us in the InfoSec world, but there's humans behind it too. There's operations and businesses, and if they don't have that in a really succinct manner and are not really paying attention, then you know, having all the automated orchestration for uh, identity lifecycle management kind of goes to naught. So we have to really work with the business to help shape that as it's emerging as well. Another area that we work on is like demand signal gathering and really targeting our education with the business. Um, you know, at Netflix, InfoSec in general, we don't believe in just general mass communications. There's a lot of noise with that. And so for us, we really are looking to leverage our security partners to target the business uh, education directly. Um, creative partners. So I think, you know, Stephanie mentioned some pretty large numbers around the number of people um, creating content. Well, they're not directly employed by Netflix. There's tons of creative partners everywhere. Production companies, post-production companies, creative agencies for marketing. And what we rationalized first is uh, from a third-party risk perspective, we needed to actually unify our guidance, whether we are working with Slack or Workday from a corporate vendor perspective or Deluxe and Technicolor, we wanted to make sure we were, we're working with our vendors and evaluating them consistently. In addition, the entertainment industry organically over time really moved into a pretty heavy audit sort of posture for their vendors and really sort of saying like, hey, this is how you should do it. We don't think that's really uh, the best bang for our buck. And what we really want to do is work with the key risk prioritized uh, partners, some of our bigger ones possibly, to help get them onto security roads that we think are, are a little bit more forward leaning. Um, it's, you know, not everyone is still on board with MFA, and we still think you know identity as a perimeter is a pretty key concept. How do we start evangelizing a lot of our post-production partners to get them on board with us? Um, and so I think those are areas that we plan as well. I see Swathi over there, who you'll hear from later in this conference. They lead our detection and response team. Uh, IR gets pretty gnarly. Um, why a liaison and why the slide? Well, I learned in the cooking world, a liaison is a binding agent. Uh, typically egg yolks, heavy cream, uh, to bind a sauce together. Um, in those large incidents, um, that context really does, cannot, you know, really have a difficulty flowing well. Uh, we want to make sure incident commanders are able to conduct the investigations appropriately, but we need to be able to reduce that techno speak and the security babble to our creative partners who are dealing with external showrunners and writers and talent to figure out, like, hey, this is really a big deal or not a big deal? Um, and to really sort of like help them calm the waters when, when it, we don't need to overblow it. In addition, there's hundreds and hundreds of productions out there. When something goes bonk in the night, we need to give them an escalation channel as well uh, to make sure that, that they're felt supported as well. And then finally, we look to handle a lot of the small fires independently. And with that context, it actually is very helpful. Um, we had a series of incidents that we thought were really small grade social engineering uh, type of attacks and low grade attempted leaks. But once we started having our team really start to take a look at them, we started pulling the thread and we said, oh my gosh, look at these are all connected. And because of that immediate context and understanding uh, the relevant business workflows, we were able to put that together quite quickly. And then finally, one area that we really play in is um, what we call taming the Kraken, the creative tech. Um, Patrick's going to talk to you a lot about how do we start to bring, um, you know, a, a security approach to a very complex infrastructure from our product engineering side that is building a whole heap of solutions to support the studio and productions themselves. But freedom and responsibility is a pretty important thing in Netflix. 
And with that also come tools of the trade. And so we're seeing a lot of tools and solutions emerge from Stephanie's side and other studio sides directly. And how do we start to solicit, you know, which ones of these do we need to start to bring onto our paved roads? How do we start to reduce the, the overall landscape of tech debt and say, look, maybe we need to start reducing these um, is a very important thing for us. And I think another place that we look for is really reshaping bets that we historically had made for as of when we were a streaming product and by and large engineering based to ones that really have more of a unique creative sort of flow. So a great example there is we made a pretty strong de-investment into centralized endpoint management, uh, which worked well for us for many years. But with the emergence of animation and visual effects artists, they're like, I don't want to deal with this. Like, just manage my stuff for me. I want to be an artist, and I don't want to have to listen to the, you know, uh, work on these things. Uh, so just deal with that. And so we need to be on that front line to capture those very quickly so we can shape the business. So what's next for us? I'll just give you a quick little taste. Um, we're, we're a young and emerging team, and, and so you know, my goal here is to really just set with you all. We're the bridge, really, between a lot of our, our centralized information security teams and our, and our product, our, our studio teams. Um, some interesting things that we are working on, one idea is something called Bodhi. Um, it's that data-driven method to help us stratify our content based on its sensitivity. Um, Bat signal is one that we're just starting to work on here, which is that unification of supply chain risks between our corporate and thousands and thousands of studio partners. And then one we just started really, uh, it's like I'll say it's even pre-vaporware and I hate presenting these things, but I really like the idea because we've really evolved the idea of security brain in Netflix, which is how do we evaluate the, the myriad of applications that we have consistently? Well, how do we do that for production? How do we start to take all those inputs about what may or may not make a production more riskier than others? And so we're starting to look at that from a really data-driven perspective as well. All right, thank you. I'll turn this over. Patrick. All right, let's bring us home here. We can talk about the engineering side of all of this. So hey, I'm Patrick. I am a security partner on our AppSec team. I started as an AppSec engineer, now I'm a security partner, and my job is to work with all the people who are building tools for Netflix as a studio. So all the tools for all the people that Stephanie and Ben just talked about. One of the things that we sometimes hear when talking at events like this is that maybe we've solved security at Netflix. Like we've got this nice streaming platform, looks pretty good, right? Call it a day. Hopefully, listening to them has got you thinking that there's sort of more interesting work going on now than ever before. So I'm going to get into some of that. We can't get into all of it, but I'm going to share sort of three themes that get me personally really excited. So for one, we're transforming a complex system. Two, we're taking this concept of usable security that you might have heard about or heard bandied around and we're pressure testing the heck out of it. And then three, we are really doubling down on the concept of security as an enabler. So I'm gonna take you through each of those three. First one, transforming a complex system, an existing working complex system. Six years ago, we were just a streaming platform fresh off of this massive transition to AWS and the microservices architecture that you've probably like heard about and seen presentations on. That was like, cool work. We were so excited about that and so proud of that. I'm going to take all of that cool work and I'm going to put it in a box and call that box our streaming architecture. But what this model leaves out is all the work and systems to actually take content from the world and make it ready to share on the service. There's an entire ecosystem to support that that kind of didn't get the sexy, cool like talks and stuff before. Those teams and applications, that's content engineering. The behind the scenes teams that get content from the world and make it ready for the streaming service. And for a while, we could get away with making them behind the scenes because most of our content sort of came ready made from a relatively small set of partners. So a few partners 
hitting a relatively small set of services. We didn't have to worry about scale or different types of relationships or technical capabilities of those different partners. Like we could kind of get away with this. But remember, now we're a studio. Think about all the people that Stephanie and Ben talked about. People going out and finding like amazing artists and stories. People on and off the set doing physical productions. All the animators, all the VFX artists. We need to connect them together too and give them access to the tools they need to do their job. So we're building and maturing that infrastructure in an amazing ecosystem for them too. That's production engineering. So combined, right now we're taking another journey that is just as fascinating to me as the one that got us to this point of the microservices architecture that everyone knows about and that's really cool. But it's not just about building that mirror image. I said earlier that we're modifying a complex system. We're adding a whole overlay of new requirements. Remember before we had basically like subscribers, employees, and a few highly trusted content partners. Now the people who are accessing our systems have literally thousands of different roles and different relationships to Netflix. And also remember, like on Ben's slide, that's per film. We're supporting many concurrent productions all around the globe, all at the same time, in every possible genre, and every single one of those people needs to have an amazing experience. So we have to engineer for like these totally new levels of complexity and nuance while keeping this whole system already flowing and working. So what does that mean from an actual like building in a complex system environment look like? One thing, variable identity confidence. So sort of one of our answers to the fact that users have varying relationships to Netflix now is that we're moving to a place where identity isn't all or nothing. It becomes this set of facts that we have sort of varying levels of trust in, and we can decide if a particular identity in our system is suitable for a given purpose, or sort of know what facts we need to upgrade. End-to-end -end identity, something we're working hugely on right now. It's important to understand calls and actions on behalf of. That's the concept of end-to-end -end identity. Because there's so many different people who might be calling literally anything in our ecosystem, and almost always through this chain of microservices. So our IPC strategy is now evolving to propagate provable caller identity everywhere on every single call. Declarative authorization policy. Because there's so many ways to access data, we want to move away from like custom business logic to make authorization decisions like in, in any given service and to declarative authorization policies that can be enforced identically no matter how you're, you're arriving at data or you're requesting data. And then unified authorization is another thing that we're working on. So internally, we have a really traditional RBAC system that's kind of been driving this for a long time. But we also have this really cool declarative system that I was talking about. And we have a central identity store that's just had to learn a ton of new tricks to support what we're doing in the studio world. So we're in the process of consolidating all of those into one system and incorporating a ton of lessons learned over the last five years of doing authorization sort of in the cloud at scale. So if you ever wanted to be on a team architecting a new distributed authorization system for thousands of applications and hundreds of thousands of users, come talk. Second one. Usable security. Martin Scorsese uses our stuff, right? Shonda Rhimes uses our stuff. Henry Cavill uses our stuff. Richard? Yeah. Thank you. One. Good. Um, so who wants to explain to them that security and usability are a trade-off, and your account's been locked out, and you need a password reset, and our SLA is 48 hours, right? Who wants to be that guy? So these are all folks who have like astronomically high expectations of everyone they work with, and they hold their tools to the same standards. So bringing technology to these audiences is giving us a chance to pressure test this concept of usable security. 
So you've seen like behind the scenes like cast interviews where they talk about all the security that surrounds big productions. Like you know they do need to know, they do code names, they shred scripts, like all that kind of stuff. So this is an industry that's used to paranoia, but enforcing it in predictable physical ways. Stuff like only distributing scripts on paper and then getting an assistant director to physically stand over someone while they read the script and then take it back when they're done so that nothing gets lost. Like that's normal. So when we're creating solutions, they must have a really good security story and it has to be one they understand. So remember, as, as Ben talked about and as Stephanie talked about, they can choose not to use our tools. That's how we roll. Because our whole goal is to enable them. So if we don't win their trust, that's their decision, and we have to go back and try harder. So any security we build has to do the right thing, and it also needs to sort of obey the changing needs of a fast-paced set. So if you're this assistant director here, and your decision um, that someone belongs physically on the set and doing something needs to be instantly translated into the digital permissions as well. So what are we sort of doing to, to make security usable in this world? A couple of things. Provisional onboarding. Earlier we talked about identity as a set of facts of varying levels of trust. We're trying out systems and approaches that let people get real work done even as there are aspects of their identity or their role that we haven't quite confirmed yet, while also sort of limiting and quantifying that risk. It's really interesting and you can see how it serves that need. Along the same lines, passwordless SSO. So if you're physically on set, remember that like assistant director before, if you're physically on set, but you're having trouble being digitally authenticated, that's just silly from like a really practical perspective. So we're working on ways to let people authenticate in alternate or combined ways that don't require them struggling with traditional passwords, resets, those kinds of flows. And then finally, stethoscope for more risk types. You might have heard Netflix talk about stethoscope before. It's kind of um, our tool to give usable nudges into secure behavior. We heard about nudges earlier today. Nudges into secure behavior, giving context without control. So, you know, it pops up and looks, gives you the, the analysis of your device, says here's some things that you could do, do what you will with that information. So we're exploring approaches to extend that approach into other types of risk, including risk from like users, from humans that you've onboarded. Uh, types of productions, the content that you're handling, those sorts of things to give that same usable security approach. Three, last one, nearest and dearest to my heart, security as an enabler. We are here to say yes. Why do we invest in security in the first place? It's so that our product teams can say yes to stuff that would sound crazy without confidence that we can nail a security story. At Netflix, we feel really, really strongly that security is an enabling force. So our job isn't to say no or that's risky. The best example I've heard that crystallizes this is, why do you have brakes on a car? It's not so you can go slower. Yeah, it's so you can go faster safely, right? So a lot of the crazy that we're doing, <laughs> good, I'm glad you got it. I really love that one, spread that, spread that. Um, so a lot of the crazy that we're talking about here comes in the form of speed. Can we turn that around in six weeks or three weeks or whatever crazy is for what we're building? We've got great product managers and designers and developers. They'll get it done, but can we share it with the world? Can the security story also be mature on that super optimistic alpha launch date? What needs to be true for an app to show up on security's radar for the very first time and be basically good to go? If you've seen us talk in the past, we've talked a lot about the paved road and sort of building a security story into the platform. Like Netflix people, paved road, paved road, paved road. You'll get tired of it after a while. We love our paved road. Um, and, but it's important because it means that the, the sort of potential areas of risk for an application shrink to just the new functionality for that app. Like, that's a, that's a much better conversation. We like that. Where do we go from there, though? 
We've been talking a lot internally about a goal of new apps in studio shipping with what we're calling zero incremental risk. What does that look like in practice? What has to be true architecturally for four or five new apps to launch all on the same day and have all of our metrics that capture risk stay completely flat? So within the next quarter or so, we're going to have the first few apps that will let us know if we found a way to pull that off. So stay tuned. And I'm not bullshitting about like quantifying risk. Tony like got three shout outs already. Like, um, we're actually looking at what it takes to capture this kind of risk. So if you haven't looked at the FAIR model, it's really cool, empowering stuff. Um, and he's helping us get uh, uh, invested in being more disciplined about how we measure this. Um, and actively sort of quantify risk in terms of real dollars, and then compare that across various options and technical controls. It's empowering, um, and it's exciting, and sort of every time we can make a decision based on like actual dollars instead of like low, medium, high, yellow, orange, red, I kind of get like giddy. It's good stuff. And that leads us into like this Tableau dashboard that shows you exactly how much of a geek I am. Like this is the thing that we've been shooting at for years and years. Is like we can do a report that says what are the riskiest apps or what are the riskiest orgs quantified in terms of actual dollar values that we can compare apples to apples around there and try things out in terms of modeling what we want to do with them. Um, this has been so long coming um, and is really exciting and we're starting to be able to do this. So hopefully we've given you a little bit of a taste of what it means to be a studio, gotten you excited about the work, and we'll be here for questions as long as you want. And then finally, I'm going to uh, really tell people if you want to follow up on anything that we talked about here, we have the Netflix lounge tomorrow night. Please drop by and sort of ask us any questions, do anything there. So um, thank you from Patrick, thank you from Ben, thank you from Stephanie, and uh, we'll be happy to take any questions. If you got questions, if we, uh, do we have a mic or just shout? There's a mic over there. I can just shout. Thank you. That sounds like a lot of people. You should totally come talk to us because we'll take multiple of them. Um, we are hiring, I know, right now for uh, a security intern. So that right there makes sense. Yes. Uh, are you going to be around? Okay, come, come on up here afterwards or make sure you drop by the lounge or hey, let, let's go and talk, talk afterwards. So thank you very much. I love it. And then on the on the talent side, we are currently hiring mostly for front end. So that's storyboard artists, visual development artists, editors. Thank you. Gentleman in the hat. Or no, yeah, sorry, I thought it was a hat. Gentleman with the nice hair. So the question was, um, can we talk a little bit more about the, the concept of sort of passwordless and, and ephemeral login? Not really, because <laughs> we're not there yet. Um, I, 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 you should drop by the lounge. I'll talk to you a little more informally afterwards and kind of sort of share where we're going. Um, but I think you can potentially sort of extrapolate from, <clears throat> from the, the way the problem was described. Like, if somebody's standing physically in front of you and they're who they say they are, 
why can't their phone just magically know, like, get them in? Or if they're on their phone, why can't they magically get into the computer um, reliably every time? And why can't that just be a normal interaction? Why would that have to be a special type of thing? So there's various ways that we're playing with. We're sketching a whole bunch of them out. We're POCing a whole bunch of them. Um, when we nail it, we'll demo it. Cool. Yes, sir. I'll repeat the question, but it sounds like the, the, the answer may be from, from one of you. The, the question was, um, we talk about this like, hey, we're enablers, not blockers, which means that at some point somebody's going to be like, eh, screw you. I'm going to go do what I was doing. Um, and when does that happen? Because it, it totally does. Even, even people who can't get into their email accounts, they'll just go use their personal email accounts. And instead of uploading files through our systems, they'll create a Dropbox folder, and they'll upload all their files there go through their hotmail, send their files to someone else. So that's like not uncommon if they can't figure out how to reset their password for our email. That's not extraordinary. That's like Tuesday. <laughs> um, but, but we're OK with that, because it gets back to that like, oh, well, we, we, we didn't win this time. We'll, we'll, we'll try something else. Let, let me give you another example. This is kind of maybe a good one for this crowd. Um, raise your hand if you've heard the concept of citizen developers. Anybody? I see that, yeah. <laughs> So uh, there's a real commoditization going on out there um, in terms of um, making, bringing development to the masses. You're seeing a lot of folks that are uh, maybe have less white hair than I do, but they, they grew up with Python. That's they everybody. Grew up, <laughs> they grew up with Python. They grew up scripting. And, and this is just the world they live in. And we're finding a lot more of those folks in Stephanie's world, in the business, like in production finance. And they're not, between that and our general more, we'll call it a little more of an open access policy at Netflix, um, you're seeing uh, the proliferation of a lot of these solutions uh, who sort of Airtable, Zapier, right, Coda, things like this. Uh, they're building themselves on, on, we're by and large an AWS shop, but we're starting to see some proliferation of things in the GCP suite. And they're just doing this on their own. And that's one of those sort of like unique security elements of like, okay, wait, how do we handle this? Are these big deals? Are these little deals? Where do we see a critical mass? Where should we go and like say, hold on, maybe we should put some of these things away and start to rally on these others? But I think our culture is more of one of where we're not necessarily blocking up front, but people will just go and find their own way, like very Jeff Goldblum, like life finds a way. And um, it's our job at Netflix to really start figuring out where that life is branching out and saying, which ones should we shepherd back in? Does that answer your question? So I'll, I'll connect that back together. Like we, I harped on the paved road. Like I heart paved road seriously. Um, but as we'll find these things, somebody whose you know job title is international publicity and is using a little bit of Python and a little bit of Airtable and a little bit of like our like functions thing to like cobble together this like pseudo app and be like, hey, I like automated half my job. And from one perspective, I was like, that's amazing. On the other perspective, like you don't know a single engineer in the company. We found out about this via some weird way. Um, like that's something that we're going to look at as a success story because it's that sort of like demand signal that he was talking about. And then we'll pave the heck out of that road. Be like, oh, you need to connect this to Airtable. We will make an awesome way to do that. That sort of flows through all the security best practices we have. So like finding out where people are going and then paving the heck out of those roads is like bread and butter. Anybody over here? Yes, sir. It sounds like what you have is a really strong risk management program that's helping uh, quantify and guide uh, a lot of the actions. Like you're saying, you know, people sending stuff to their personal email, and I almost had a heart attack. Um, but I get it, right? You have, you have a high volume of, of, of projects and, and all that stuff. So, so I guess, would there be any possibility of a sort of a risk management focused presentation by Netflix at a conference in the future to sort of, as an overarching view, Right. Here's how Netflix is handling 
the, the content, the challenges, the technology, the engineering, because that's really that mix of a business discussion and a technical discussion and a culture discussion. Just yeah, an open, open thought. Awesome question. I, I Tony just gave yeah. me the thumbs up. So <laughs> hey, Tony here, who we've like, he's gotten all the, the props. And Shannon, if she was in the room, would, would get a bunch. Uh, he sent me a 50 slide presentation. I cut it down to one. Um, so that's the that's the thing that you're that you're looking for. Um, I, I'll, I'll give two answers. For one, yes, I I would love to see that presentation when it exists. Um, uh, I, we also have because we're Netflix, a very um, you, you're talking about sort of a risk management um, uh, approach. We also have a risk tolerance approach, which is I think maybe the the thing that's easy to forget in the background. Um, but to to that question, yes, bug him and make him give a talk. I would also add very quickly that um, I wouldn't come out here and, and, and like evangelize, like, hey, wow, we've got risk management figured out and it's totally mature. This is, uh, I think we are still evolving along with the rest of the industry and the rest of you in here. I think for us, though, as we consider a new business, as we consider the scale, um, we need to invest in it heavily to really start like figuring out where we're going to prioritize our efforts. Um, I think it's always one of those things I said over and over, but for us now, um, it's paramount. It's just it's just something we can't keep up with based on the scale. Um, I just wanted to system. mention that later this week, uh, one of our colleagues is going to publish uh, a blog post and some open source work related to uh, risk quantification for applications and application risk scoring that we've done. So that should be coming out on the Netflix tech blog later this week. This is Asta Singal, who's my manager and the director of application security. Any other questions? I'll do another one for you. I was a big fan of the Lisa kind of open perimeter when it came out. Um, how are you adapting that and moving or shifting back into a managed endpoint space with studios that you don't necessarily own the, the end machine? So I, that's a good question. Um, we're starting that out in-house first. So I think it, in a unique way, um, productions are, are kind of, they're out there. They're their own entity. They manage their own infrastructure. Animation is actually one of those unique sort of hybrids. It's a separate production company, but it's still probably closer, more closer to home because we manage those artists more directly in their infrastructure. Um, we are beginning to take a look at not only the centralized endpoint management, um, but also how that shims into our adaptive auth story as well, the sort of nudge um, uh, story. And I think, you know, just opening the kimono and being a little more transparent, it's, it's that struggle for us at Netflix on finding the balance between freedom and responsibility versus like dictating like thou shalt. And I think what we're starting to hone in are if there's a demand signal, let's go for it. If there are riskier data sets um, that require a managed endpoint, then we may start to use things like stethoscope. We're starting to just sort of rationalize around these ideas. Is something like stethoscope a good front end to give us the context when you uh, hit that data set saying like, hey, no, we actually do want to manage these endpoints when they access those uh, more uh, sensitive pieces of data. It, it's something we're still working through right now, but it's, um, it's probably not going to lean all the way to 100% thou shalt, but it's not going to be a completely optional thing either. I'll, I'll add to that. All of this true. And, and yet, at the same time, even when we are managing the endpoints for sort of reasons of animated convenience or the, the developers, the people who are sort of using these systems, um, managing it to support them in doing what they need to do, getting the software on, getting keys, licenses, like management for that. Um, but the Lisa principle still applies there. Um, actually, um, John's team, the team that he manages, um, some of the stuff that they build for us is incredibly robust ways to get really good sort of identity proofs into the hand, like dropped onto those machines, so that they can call our APIs with the same level of confidence that if something was like a cloud instance could call our APIs. Different routes of trust, but we funnel those through the same sorts of technology. So sort of like in terms of what they can do, the Lisa model still applies, but in terms of how we're supporting how that, that workstation works, um, that's that's the shift. But we're doing it for a different reason in security. I think there's, you know, for, for interest, you know, um, we've by and large moved to a, a cloud-based or, or SaaS-based sort of offering, and I think the Lisa model generally works, you know, fairly well in that construct. I think what we found interesting over the past couple of years, um, as we started really scouring LA, 
we're like, oh, okay, well, you know, we don't need these data centers anymore. Um, and then also we're like, what are those shuttle drives doing over there? What are those like Mac trash cans doing over there? Like, oh my gosh, there's like hundreds of them. And what you're starting to find with these new patterns is like there's a, a high bandwidth, low latency problem for animators, for visual effects artists, for people that are like manipulating content. And there's that last mile latency problem. And now we're starting to have to go back to the drawing board and saying like, oh my gosh, do we need local near-prem infrastructure? How do we start to think about that type of solutioning? Um, especially as we think about a global presence uh, and we're thinking about that artist who wants to work in you know, uh, Bangkok or Malaysia or somewhere like that. And so some of those problems that we kind of considered old are coming back at us again, which are going to need to impact and influence some of our endpoint and Lisa networking you know, sort of decision models as well. So it's kind of a very interesting time in terms of a lot of those strategy bets that many of you may have heard before. And for anybody who hadn't heard it before, Lisa is the Location Independent Security, somebody? Approach? Aware. What's that? Appro location Independent Security Approach, the idea that your network position shouldn't give you any rights or permission. So, um, you know, internal is as good as external. It's the identity that we care about. Any other questions? Going once, twice. Cool, we'll be hanging out up here. Feel free to drop on by and ask any questions. Really appreciate folks showing up. Please, please, please come to the lounge tomorrow, continue the discussion, and uh, just really thank you so much for coming.